you very much for your attention and uh, for your participation here today. Uh, before I get started, uh, I, I guess as the last speaker, it's, it's uh, my privilege to thank our friend uh, Lisa Petrides and her colleagues for the fa fabulous work that they've done bringing together such an inspiring group of people. Um, I met Lisa a number of years ago at a, uh, uh, on a nature hike organized by the Hewlett Foundation of uh, people that were working to transform uh, education. And, and, um, and uh, Lisa on that hike was always ahead of the group and, and knew what was around the next corner and, and was hover, hurrying everybody up to come see the latest fantastic sight that that scenery allowed. And to see her play that role, who would have thought when she founded the Institute for the Study of Knowledge Management in Education that that was the frontier for where not only our nation would need to be considering and moving, but also for the entire global enterprise. But she saw it with great clarity long before many of us did. And it is that same sense of clarity with which she's brought us together uh, here today um, and mixed together with great volition a group of people uh, in, in, a, in uh, an obvious desire to create not a seminar, but a movement. And not a moment, but a set of catalytic actions. And so I hope all of us will live up to the promise and dream that she has for us. In the greatest honor of my life, um, I get to say the following words. And you'll understand in a moment um, why it's a particularly great honor for me. But I get to extend to you the greetings from the President of the United States, Barack Obama, and from the Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, and from my close colleague and my immediate boss, Under Secretary Martha Cantor, who has responsibility for formulating and executing all of this nation's higher education policies and programs. The reason I tell you that that is a great honor it, and uh, one that I never anticipated is um, to walk you through a little bit, just a little bit of my personal history, enough to let you know um, uh, the bona fides that bring me here which, and that brought me into the Obama administration, which are quite unlike those for senior policy officials uh, in higher education. In fact, Under Secretary Cantor and myself are the highest ranking federal officials in the history of this country who come from the community college movement. Um, and that is a substantial change in direction for uh, how the federal administration uh, intersects with higher education. Um, I and my sister um, uh, stopped out of high school uh, when I was uh, about uh, 14, 15 years old and my sister was 13 um, because of uh, desperate problems in our family. Single parent family, we grew up on welfare and food stamps, had no money, um, uh, often no medical care. Um, and my sister and I both went to work in the same pizza parlor uh, having dropped out of high school. Um, I worked in that pizza parlor for uh, a number of years um, and, uh, and eventually managed to leave there and work in a series of other menial jobs as I was trying to get a better career off the ground. And um, the doors opened to my career as a writer. I went on to, to some success as a writer and a media producer. One day when I was in the pizza parlor and I picked up after having uh, worked a full shift, the job ended at 1 a.m. I was 14 and a half years old. And uh, I picked up a newspaper and there was a big article there about high school dropouts. And it was all very pejorative, I thought. Uh, it talked about what's wrong with these kids. Don't they understand that education's important? They must all be on drugs and whatnot. And I remember that night I walked home with my $11 that I had made in cash, paid under the table out of the cash register. And, uh, and I wrote in pencil on binder paper a letter to the editor, objecting to the use of the term dropouts. And I explained that my sister and myself and all the people that we knew who were in similar situations didn't drop out of anything, we were pushed out. And not only were we pushed out, but nobody ever came looking for us once we were gone. We didn't matter to anybody. And that reality, uh, uh, which I reflected in that letter, I, I put in an envelope and a stamp, and one day, about four days later, the editor of the local newspaper tracked me down at my place of employment, and he asked me the question that changed my life. He said, can we run your letter to the editor as an op-ed and pay you for it? And that action made me understand that there was opportunities beyond the horizons that I, that I saw. And so now fast forward 40 years later and I sit as the senior policy advisor in the office of the Undersecretary of Education, where right down the hall from me is the Secretary of Education and all of the people in the federal government in the Obama administration who are responsible for formulating and executing higher education policy in this country. We have not brought in the Obama administration the change that we know 
the American people expect and demand and require of us. But let me tell you, the team that we have assembled in the Department of Education is working night and day around the clock to try and make the possibility of that change real. And I'm here today to ask for your active partnership, to inform you about what we are doing, and to let you know that without your engagement and without your increased efforts, um, we will not succeed. It depends on you as much as it depends on us. First, since this is the Big Ideas Festival, let me tell you President Obama's big idea. His big idea is that everyone matters and that we need to harness the creativity and abilities of every individual in order uh, to secure the future of our nation. And um, this is uh, both a practical and an idealistic belief. This is a belief rooted in a religious tradition that teaches us about the dignity of every soul, which is part of uh, the president's uh, approach to life. But it's also rooted in the practical realities of what's facing us as a nation and the challenges that are facing us in the century ahead. As we know, because of the desperate financial situation that our administration inherited when we got to Washington, we found ourselves in the deepest fiscal ditch in a generation. The expenditures that were required to rescue the financial system and to ameliorate the most desperate effects of the situation that we inherited have imposed a substantial debt burden on the United States of America. If you sit down with the economists and the Treasury Department officials, you quickly realize that there is no way that we can emerge and satisfy that debt obligation and also grow the kinds of institutions and individuals that we want unless we do a much better job of harnessing the creativity and capacity of all of our citizens. To do that will require a fundamental redefinition of what we think about when we think about quality, quality in education and particularly quality in higher education. Forgive me for a second, I'm losing my, my voice and need to see if I can preserve it. Quality. <clears throat> How do we define quality in higher education? Well, for most of my lifetime, to use a, a, a formulation created by my dear friend, uh, uh, President Brian Murphy of nearby De Anza College, a, a great leader in higher education, quality in higher education has been defined by the quality of people excluded from it. Think about that. That a school is thought to be high quality because of the quality of people that it does not let in. President Murphy says that what we need to do is to move to a different model of quality, a model of quality of education where we judge the quality of education by the quantity and quality of the graduates produced. A fundamental reorientation of what it means to have a high quality education. That the old elitist model, that some tiny group that excludes everybody else can be seen as the exemplar of quality, we have to find ways to turn that upside down so that quality is a reflection of how many people are included and the quality of their uh, persons, the quality of their humanity when they emerge from our system. What they are capable of producing comes much closer to uh, their innate capacities that have a chance to be developed. So we absolutely need to expand the reach and depth of education, and in particular higher education in this country, and we need to do it in the most fundamental ways possible that involve changing the entire cultural understanding of what quality of education means, and that quality of education that is exclusive is, is inimical to our national interests, and that our national interests require an education system where inclusion is, uh, is an expectation at the baseline. Or to put it in the way, in the words that my undersecretary of education, uh, Martha Cantor, likes to put it, she says, here in America, we need to educate the top 100% of the American people. How are we going to do that? Well, President Obama has set an ambitious goal and has provided a budget that will allow the most fundamental transformation with your help of education and in particular higher education in our lifetimes. It's uh, reflected in uh, a piece of legislation that has passed the Congress called the American Graduation Act, the American Graduation Initiative rather. And that, the, the goal that the President set, which many think is so ambitious as to be unrealizable, but we don't accept that is that 
By 2020, the United States will once again have the highest proportion of college-educated, college diploma-owning, or college certificate-owning um, uh, uh, proportion of population in the world, moving us from approximately 40% of our population to approximately 60% of our population, or more, uh, by 2020. Um, there's some problems, though. Our current higher education system can't get us to that goal not as it's currently formulated, and not as it currently works. Um, what's more, if you look at the demographics and the numbers that are involved, in order to get to that goal, um, even if we graduated the young college-going high school cohort at what most people think is the optimal rates that could be achieved, it would only close about one-third of the gap of where we, of the goal that the president has set in terms of college um, completion and attainment. The other two-thirds of those uh, newly educated uh, workforce members who we want to see get college uh, opportunities and college degrees, the other two-thirds have to come from the ranks of adult students, displaced workers, the auto workers who have been laid off, uh, all of the other manufacturing workers who don't have jobs, uh, and the people for whom uh, school did, uh, for whatever reasons, either economically or pedagogically, was not appealing. Two-thirds. Of, of the educated citizens that we need to create between now and 2020 have to come from the ranks of those adults. Uh, so that, again, is a, a fundamental transformation for what we're expecting. That also includes the 80 million or so American adults who lack the basic literacy or numeracy skills that are required to be competitive applicants in a knowledge-based economy. A staggering challenge and one that will require innovation, new ways of thinking, new collaborations, and fundamentally new approaches to, to uh, higher education in, uh, access and inclusion. What are the tools of change? Let me move on quickly and let you know what the president has proposed and uh, what your role might be in it, we hope. The uh, Recovery Act funds that have already been appropriated by Congress and that have been placed at the disposal of the Department of Education include $650 million that's been set aside for an innovation fund in education. The grant applications for those uh, um, the, the competitions will be going out uh, in just a few weeks, and I urge you to watch the Department of Education's website to look at that and to uh, uh, keep an eye on the Federal Register. Let me tell you, uh, quite honestly, um, we have no idea who's, who we're going to give that money to, who the Federal Government is going to give that money to. What we're trying to do is to architect a competition that will bring out uh, the best ideas that have the best chances, as judged by independent peer review panels, of moving the country towards the President's goals. Um, and so those innovation grants are one part of how uh, of the, uh, the, ch the sort of levers of change that we have to make possible. But 650 million, while an important amount of resources, pales in comparison to the $12 billion American Graduation Initiative, which passed the Congress as H.R. 3221 and which is currently pending in the U.S. Senate. Um, and uh, that bill includes uh, several billion dollars in each of several pots. Um, one of them is a College Access and Success Fund, which is uh, designed to help institutions that are willing to engage in transformative efforts to substantially increase their degree completion and success uh, ratios and the amount of uh, essentially their uh, productivity as a social institution. The Community College Challenge Grants, which are going to be um, uh, dedicated specifically to community colleges, which is where uh, most Americans get their higher education. And those grants, again, are going to be designed uh, to figure out how we can move towards accelerated learning, towards more competency-based approaches. This old factory model that everybody, and I've heard it decried by so many knowledgeable people here at this at this session today, but this whole idea that you're going to put 40 students in a room, whether they're kindergartners or uh, um, uh, graduate students, and you're going to uh, linearly, linearly present them with information at the same pace and, and with the same style, and then expect that everybody is going to follow you at the same pace when we all know everybody that uh, paces their learning differently, and some people are bored by what other people need more attention to, and that we simply don't have the models that allow us to move towards competence based education in a way that allows degrees and certificates to be awarded while maintaining the quality level of those degrees and certificates. So we're going to be looking for innovative strategies that will make that happen. 
Uh, a quick word in just the two minutes that are remaining to me as to how organizations and groups, including those in this room, might qualify for some of this funding. The biggest um, piece of advice I could give to you, which I give uh, routinely in these kinds of settings, is, is look for dance partners. Um, I can tell you now already, it just seems apparent to me that there's going to be a lot of good ideas that come forward seeking some of this money. I should also in, uh, uh, mention that in this money is the President's proposal for half a billion dollars, $500 million, for the creation of open education resources, full courses, that the United States will make available both to individual learners, to institutions that want to employ them, and also as a mechanism to project soft American power so that uh, other nations and other students around the world can come to know the United States, as previous generations did. You remember we used to ship those uh, big sacks of food and it would say a gift of the, from the people of the United States. Well, President Obama is determined to see that the rest of the world comes to know us, the United States of America, from the gifts of learning materials that we make available free to all the citizens of the world. And that's his commitment, and that money will be made available uh, pending the passage of this legislation next year. The most substantial federal investment in the creation of free learning materials, and also the greatest increase in access to high-quality education in the history of the world. Um, look for not only great ideas, but look for partners who you can work with to develop your ideas and to bring forward grant applications that solve the adoption problem as much as possible in the creation process. Um, we're, at a, we're at a stage of crisis in this country right now where it won't be enough for us to fund great ideas simply because they're a great idea um, and then hope people will adopt them. We've seen a lot of those efforts come to nothing. We need to figure out how to involve the consumer community, students and others, in, um, uh, in, in using these resources in ways uh, that will assure that once the materials are created, there's a collaborating community of practice around these materials. And then finally, um, let me do something that I think a lot of people need in order to have the courage it takes to move forward in these difficult times, which is to give you the permission of the federal government. Uh, we need, we need your help. We've got your back. The time is now. Thank you. <laughs>